So this sample brick shows many of the pitfalls and many of the superpowers that 3D printing has that many people don't realize. So in this video, we're gonna go through it from bottom to top and talk about each one of them in detail. So the Slant 3D sample brick was actually designed several years ago, and we use it to communicate to clients core features around 3D printing, both to avoid and to go after. Starting at the very bottom, the first item that you see is actually the small hemisphere sticking out the side. You have a large one and a small one. This is to detail the fact that overhangs can be a problem. When you have a hemisphere, the first thing that can happen if you make it too large is that the very bottom can have just a little bit of sag and drip to it, because as the layers build up, initially a hemisphere starts coming out of the wall perfectly horizontal. Now when it's really small like this one, it's not really a big issue because it's able to build up gradually compared to the layer heights. But if it gets larger in proportion to the layer heights, then you can start to have more sag down here on the bottom. The way of fixing that is to apply a fillet to the bottom of it, as we did here with this cylinder sticking out the side. This allows you to then create something that has a nice smooth transition. But again, here in this case, if you keep it as a cylinder rather than a hemisphere, then you can have overhang again on the outer edge. So there you might actually want to use a chamfer. Turning around to the other side, you have a demonstration of all the various types of holes. Now you have, of course, circular holes, both small and large, and you can see that with small holes, generally the dimensional tolerances are maintained a little bit better, whereas with the large holes, again, the top of the hole can have sag compared to the layer lines, so you end up having what looks like a little bit of squashing of the hole. The way of fixing this is to use a teardrop shape. And then, of course, you have square holes where there's really no problem at all because you have straight, easy bridging. Until bridging gets so long that you can potentially have sag in the upper level of it, as demonstrated in this hole. That is something to be avoided. You want to avoid very long overhangs whenever you can, because they can lead to dimensional instability of that slot if you're making something large like that. Then over here on this side, we talk about overhangs even more. We have a standard unsupported overhang to demonstrate what can happen if you don't have supports designed in or activated, or if you're just designing a feature that is horizontal, because it's not always intuitive, the fact that 3D printing just shoots out into thin air and then comes back, and you end up with a sag right there. There is, first of all, the CleverX solution, which is to use a chamfer of about 45 to 35 degrees, so that you have a nice clean buildup in order to support that overhang, and then a less good solution, which is the fillet underneath, because, again, it looks fine, because you start out like that, but by the time you get to the top of it, it turns into a horizontal feature again. So you end up having just a little bit of sag out there on the edge. So that is to illustrate all of those. Then on this other side, we wanted to show that you can do these really complex and kind of deep geometries. So if you want a grip or other sort of contact surface, you can make these really thick, deep surface textures that aren't really common with other types of manufacturing because they can be so expensive. Now moving up to the next layer where we actually highlight textures and also highlight some of the problems with textures. The very first and simplest texture is literally just a circle that has been embossed into the side of the part and just repeated over and over again. This is a really good texture for hiding layer lines because it can be really subtle, but it still looks pretty darn good. And then here on the side, you have a diamond pattern, just kind of a knurling, so people can get a feel of what that looks like when it's embedded just a half a millimeter into the surface of the thing. Again, these, surf these textures are used to hide the surface finish, so you don't have to have the 3D printed look. You can make the layer lines disappear by applying these types of textures. But the thing to be afraid of is what happens over here on this other side. Right here, this surface, if you get in real close to it, you'll see that it's actually not a good surface. It looks kind of like leftover wispiness. This is because the surface edges were too thin to where the nozzle and the slicer doesn't really identify them cleanly so that you end up with this just kind of partial extrusion out there onto the surface. So you wanna make sure that you're making surfaces that have features that are at least the width of the nozzle. So in this case, 0.4 millimeters. These were a little bit thinner than that, so they end up just kind of being eh, kind of there, but not really. So this is really important to detail that you wanna make sure features are thick enough to actually be printed. And then the last texture that we talk about over here is kind of inspired by the leaves on a forest floor. The leaves are all the same basic shape, but as they rotate and move around, you end up getting something that looks complex and completely random. This is what you can do with textures if you don't want the repeated like knurling pattern or the circles just repeated over. You can create a small section of patterning and then repeat that over and over again and potentially rotate and move it around depending on how good you are at CAD. And then you can create something that looks a lot more random and can help to disperse and move the texture around more and more so it's not as patterned looking. 
Coming around on these edges, we have an example of a filleted outer edge and then sharp main corners around here. This is to detail how you can have issues come up with this. You want to make sure you're rounding all of your vertical edges as much as you possibly can because it creates a cleaner looking part and also helps to reduce print time. Whereas these sharp edges can lead to print failures because seams can all align there and you end up with retraction problems but they also just are not always as crisp. So people have a tough time contextualizing how tight and sharp 3D printed parts can be, and these corners help to illustrate that. Moving up to section three, the first thing that we have is text. We have both embossed and embedded so that you can see what the contrast is right there. When the text goes into the part, that's generally what you prefer because you don't have to worry about the overhangs of it as much, but you only wanna go in about half a millimeter, maybe a millimeter tops. Embossed, you have a much bigger problem with saying because the lettering is coming out, it's a horizontal overhang. If it's more than a half a millimeter, you see sag and drag at the bottom of these letters. But you can also see how the different fonts can vary, how stark and how crisp and clear they are. You never really want to do a font smaller than an eighth of an inch on any part of a 3D printed part. And that's to detail this. So the slant up here is about an eighth of an inch large, and then the 3D is a quarter inch large, just so that you have good differentiation. But whenever you want to, you want to embed the text inside of there. Then on the other side, we have two holes. So these holes are actually connected. They're a curved hole through the top, which is generally fairly difficult to machine because you have to connect the holes and maintain a really smooth filleted inner corner, which can take a long time in machining because you have to slowly create that smooth curve in there many steps at a time. Whereas it's very easy to do with 3D printing. But then in addition to those two holes, we have a filleted hole and a chamfered hole so that you can see the full 360 behavior of those types of features into the side, both the fillet and the chamfer. The fillet you can kind of see again helps to keep the hole crisp and round and you have less of the sagging that you see down in the holes down here. But the chamfer is even better because it's the perfect way of maintaining constant layer deposition as they're building up. Whereas again, the fillets start from infinity and then go up to level. A chamfer is a consistent stair step all the way up. And then on the very top, the thing we look at here is actually two types of holes. You have a hole without a filleted top edge. So that you have just a straight 90 degrees to the hole and then you have a slight fillet on the other one, about a one millimeter fillet. You always wanna fillet all of the vertical edges on your part whenever possible. And this is to really detail that. The one that is perfectly vertical and has a 90 degree interface with the top surface can potentially have problems of hole pull out and that kind of thing. If you fillet it just a little bit, it lets more layers kind of build up around the outer edge of the hole. So it remains clean and doing things like heat inserts and that kind of stuff come along much better. It also serves as a funneling and finding feature, so if you put a screw in there, the hole just goes in. It's a countersink that you just wanna do. And then lastly, we have a small dome sitting on top so that you can see how the layers build over and start to become more and more stark as the curve gets steeper. And that is how you top off the final Slant 3D sample brick. The sample brick, again, as we said, is meant to show all the ways 3D printing can be used well and usefully by like using textures which come free or detailed complex internal geometries that are actually fairly difficult to machine like internal S curves and that kind of thing. But then also the things to avoid like bad sorts of inserts and overhangs and also how to do text in a way that looks good for your particular application. So this covers most of the main basic things that we tell people to be aware of when designing for 3D printing without requiring them to have to learn every one of them independently. They can see them all when they're looking at the sample brick and how it was made and the things to watch out for with it. Have a great day, everybody.